A Gina target vehicle 5001A was launched on November 11, 1966 at 7.08 p.m. UTC from Launch Complex 14 at Cape Canaveral. Meant to serve as a docking target for Gemini 12, it was originally the ground test article and not meant to fly. Rather than order a new Agena though, the program just decided to refurbish this one and launch it for this last mission of the Gemini program. On its way to orbit though, the Agena seemed to have a brief mysterious issue with pump performance but there were conflicting readings. Since they were aware this was a refurbished article, that anomaly was spooky enough to lead to the cancellation of a plan to use the Agena engine to boost Gemini 12's orbit, as had been done on previous missions. Since that had already been demonstrated successfully before, it wasn't a big loss to the mission plan, and it was a solid safety measure. As it turned out, Mission Control tried to fire the Agena engine after Gemini 12's return, and it simply refused to start. That wasn't the only problem with this Agena though, as the rendezvous radar would also send messed up information to Gemini 12, requiring the astronauts to dock manually. Gemini 12 was launched one orbit or roughly one and a half hours after Agena at 8.46 p.m. UTC from Launch Complex 19. It carried Jim Lovell on his second space flight and Buzz Aldrin on his first. Buzz was an unconventional astronaut in that, while he had been a fighter pilot who flew combat missions in Korea, he had never been a test pilot and felt excluded from the test pilot club that dominated NASA's manned spacecraft program. He also had a doctorate in astronautics from MIT, the first astronaut to have a doctorate and was viewed as more of a scientist, an egghead if you will. He specialized in rendezvous and maneuvers in space and crafted the methods for manual rendezvous that other missions had been testing. In this mission, with the radar messing up and him finally getting to fly after being left on the bench for so long, he finally got to put his theories into direct practice and manage the rendezvous with minimal propellant usage. Aldrin also had the task of conducting three spacewalks, EVAs, that NASA hoped would solve the problems they'd been having with astronauts working in space. He had been the backup to Gene Cernan for Gemini 9A, the first flight to have EVA problems, and now Cernan was his backup. So he was the first to fly with close knowledge of what happened there and the time to train for it. He also was the first to be able to use underwater training, which had been advocated by Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter and built largely to prepare for Skylab, America's first space station, and a planned offshoot of the Apollo program that was already in active development. You see, the Apollo lunar missions were not expected to require zero gravity spacewalks unless there was an emergency. All the EVAs were going to be on the lunar surface with one sixth gravity. Skylab was another matter though. So Aldrin had solid underwater experience, but also, critically, handholds and foot restraints. The input from both Mike Collins and Dick Gordon had been clear about the need for these. As a result, Aldrin completed three EVAs, two of which were the easier stand-up EVA types, while one was a two-hour full EVA, and completed them successfully with minimal exertion. The full EVA included attaching another tether to the Agena and trying to rotate the Gemini and Agena to generate artificial gravity again, but as on Gemini 11, the tether remained slack. With this last Gemini mission, NASA felt it had finally confirmed that astronauts could effectively work without the presence of gravity, though much more work would need to be done to refine techniques. Thank you for watching this mission profile of Gemini 12.